Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. In fact, I first met many of the organizers at the Schrodinger Institute more years ago than I can remember, but a uh, long time ago. And uh, I've had very fruitful collaborations with Michael and Roland ever since. So it's lovely to be here. Um, so the title of my talk is Quantum Field Theory on Low Regularity Space Times. But you'll see shortly that the regularity isn't that low. Uh, and I'll explain why the regularity isn't that low later on. Um, but as far as I could tell, quantum field theory had never been done seriously on anything other than smooth space times. So as an exercise, I just wanted to see what could be done when you had finite differentiability and so I started with something uh, of low regularity where I could manage everything. And I'll, I'll make comments on what one can do in lower regularity than the example I give. Um, I think as always, uh, Vittori said at the introduction, I think looking at low regularity also brings into focus things that are not so clear when you do things in the smooth case, you see what, what things survive in low regularity and what things don't. And I think that in itself is a useful thing to do. Um, I'm going to be using the algebraic approach um, and I'll ask questions about what regularity is, is needed. Um, and the starting point is to look at just simply uh, the wave equation or actually more the Klein-Gordon equation for low regularity metrics. Um, I'll say something about a notion that Chris Clark introduced, which was called generalized hyperbolicity. So if you have global, globally hyperbolic space times, then the wave equation is well posed. But Chris Clark said one should look at things from a different perspective simply ask, when is the wave equation well posed? And it can be well posed in non-globally hyperbolic space times. And then he called that generalized hyperbolicity. And of course, when you start asking that question about well posedness, you immediately get into the issue of what function space is one's talking about. And we'll see this is relevant here. Um, and then when we look at the quantization, We'll be looking at it, uh, the, the green operators, the causal propagator, the symplectic form, as advertised by Chris, and uh, quantization. Um, yeah. I'll... So this is just something about um, motivation. That's why I started looking at this problem. So. When we study general relativity, we define general relativity on, on a space where we can do the various calculations in such that the Einstein equations or the vacuum equations are well defined in some suitable sense. And, you can, and from that point of view, you can, you can think of uh, singularities as obstructions to extending space time. And conventionally, you think of them as obstructions to the evolution of test particles. But Chris Clark had this idea that rather than looking at singularities as obstructions to test particles, one should allow certain weak singularities to be regarded as interior points of the space time. And that one would then be probing them not just by a single particle, but by a test field, so that the, they'd be obstructions to the evolution of classical test fields. And this was manifested in a failure of generalized hyperbolicity. That's to say that the solution of the wave equation on this as a background space time uh, was not well posed. And uh, one could as well just do it not for classical fields, but quantum fields. So, it was this perspective that got me interested in this in the first place. Uh, so you can 
think from this point of view that we want to use these quantum fields as probes of singularities. Now, one of the things that you can be interested in is the strength of a singularity. And one way that you can measure the strength of singularity is you can have a look at a test field propagating on a background, and you can calculate the energy momentum tensor and see what happens to that energy momentum tensor near the singularity. Uh, from the point of view of the mathematics, which I'm going to talk about now, the, when we're th talking about the evolution of the fields, we ask what's the causal propagator. And then also, we're also interested in what we regard as the physical states of the system. And so, what are the physical states? And as, as you know, once you're in a curved space-time, the notion of what the vacuum state is becomes very problematic. So, um, I'm going to use the algebraic approach to quantization. And more or less, I'm just going to work through the paper by, by Bergenou and Pfeffler and just see what happens in the low regularity setting. So, in the smooth case, you start by uh, looking at Cauchy problem for some smooth uh, hyperbolic equation, so PU equals F. Uh, just for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to take it to the Klein-Gordon equation there. And one wants to look at um, the corresponding result on the globally hyperbolic space-time, and you need this uh, causal support condition. So this is the these, this is initial values, and this is the source. And then a key thing from this point of view are the existence and, and uniqueness of advanced and retarded green operators that map between these spaces, which have these properties here. So the two-sided inverses, and you have the support condition. Sorry, what was? U naught and U1 are, are the initial data, then the derivative. Sorry. And again, a lot of it, of what happens is uh, described by this exact sequence here. This is our differential operator. This is the causal, I've got the causal propagator here, g plus minus g minus, and that will turn out to be a key part of the quantization. And then what you can do is you can define this, using this, a skew symmetric bilinear form, which is just constructed using the, the L2 in a product of the green operator applied to phi and psi. And the thing about that is, as it stands, that's a, a degenerate in a product, so it's, it doesn't give you the symplectic form, but you can turn it into symplectic form on the quotient space here, and the quotient space you factor through by the kernel of G, which, as from this exact sequence, is simply the uh, P applied to uh, GM. So that gives you your symplectic form. And you then need to do a bit of housekeeping to check that everything you've done is compatible with the causal uh, structure. So that comes out of the fact that you're dealing with hyperbolic operators, so there's nothing too difficult there. And then you go on to construct the canonical commutation relations on the space of quasi-local C-star algebras. And that's a more or less algebraic uh, construction. There's very little there where one has to worry too much about regularity issues. So it turns out that the regularity issues are really all to do with this, this early part of the construction. The final thing that one does from this uh, 
algebraic quantization point of view is in a sense you get a very nice mathematical structure but you want it to represent the physics and some of the states you get are not ones which correspond to the physical states you want to look at. So you need some way of picking out the physical fields and there's a very, very nice way of doing this using a, a micro-local spectrum condition on the two-point function. And Chris said a bit about that earlier. And this is going to be quite problematic once one goes to lower regularity. So the two issues that one's going to look at in more detail with lower regularity is trying to get something that corresponds to this in lower regularity and what happens to the micro-local spectrum condition. Those are the two main, main issues. The first one turns out to be comparatively easy once you make the right choice of function space. Um, if you don't make the right choice of function space, it's not so easy. So that was the main thing that we had to have some thought of. So what are the issues in low regularity? So the first, of, first question is, what, what is a reasonable regularity for uh, the metric? Um, one of the things that you do when you're proving well-posedness is you don't just use first order en energy estimates, you, you use higher order energy estimates in order to understand the behavior of the solution. And those might not be something you can calculate so easily if the metric is of low regularity. There's this issue I've already talked about, which is the choice of function space for the green operators, because once we're in re no regularity, it's going to be a map between Sobolev spaces. There's the symplectic form, what space is this going to be defined on? And the exact sequence result, is this going to remain true once we're in the non-smooth case? Um, and the main thing here is, uh, is going to be the issue of what's called the time slice uh, axiom. Is the time slice result going to be true? That's to say, if you... Uh, the causality is determined by the behavior in the neighborhood of a time slice, is that going to be true in low regularity? And then finally, there's this micro-local condition. So those are the various issues we're going to have to deal with. So my starting point is going to, I'm simply going to take the metric to be C11. I'm not, at the moment, going to try and take any lower regularity. I'll make comments on what one can do in lower regularity and what are the problems if one chooses lower regularity. But I started with C11 because it seemed to me to be uh, a reasonable expectation that the theory would go through in that case. And the whole point about C11 is, is, is that the curvature is bounded, but you can have jumps. It's the minimal condition ensures existence and uniqueness of solutions to the geodesic equation. And you don't really have any issues with uh, causality results. Um, and uh, you can expect the solutions of the wave equation to be reasonably well behaved. Um, from the point of view of physics, one of the things that you should um, want is that the energy momentum tensor is something that you can define at least distributionally. So the, the, the regularity you need, you would certainly need to talk about energy momentum tensor is that uh, your solution is in H1 because you want the energy momentum tensor essentially involves squares of the derivative. Uh, the, the method we're going to use, uh, there are other methods, but it turns out if you want to make sure you're going to get the right causal solution is to use results we have from the smooth setting and we're going to take a smoothing while we control the 
causal structure. So we're going to replace G by G epsilon, but we're going to maintain this condition here so that we, we have control over the causality. And because we're working with the smooth theory, we have no problem calculating higher order any energy estimates. And although it wasn't necessary for this piece of work, it is actually possible in this case to construct what's called a Colombo solution. And a Colombo solution is in fact a, a smooth family, family of solutions. It's more precisely an equivalent class of a family of smooth solutions. And I just thought I'd mention uh, Colombo because some of us who worked in this area before it became super fashionable had a different approach to low regularity things which involved looking at Colombo objects which are you model something which has low regularity by a smooth family. You could describe that as an analytic approach and I Although it hasn't been discussed at the workshop here, I think there's a lot, of, lot that can still be done by using analytic and regularization methods. And in particular, I think it's going to be quite interesting to relate what you get through regularization and analytic methods to the synthetic approaches. So those of you that were at Mike's talk in Toronto will have heard a bit about that. Uh, and then you can use a compactness argument to show that the generalized solution converges to the weak solution uh, of the original equation. And then you use the fact that you've controlled the causal structure to show in the initial, uh, with a zero initial data case, you satisfy the support condition. Um, so one of the things that's quite quite useful is that even in the non-smooth case, you can actually choose a smooth temporal function. And in some of our constructions, it's very useful that the temporal function we work with is smooth. So uh, the way you proceed from doing the calculations is essentially you calculate a whole lot of, uh, you do the standard construction, you can't do various uh, energy inequalities. So you first use the divergence theorem on the energy momentum tensor so to get uh, an energy inequality which bounds uh, <coughs> the solution by the solution on the initial data and the L2 norm of the source. You can use this uh, energy inequalities so that these solutions are unique with F in this space and this initial data. And you can use the energy inequality on this space to, sh to get the support uh, condition. Uh, and then what you need to do is you take these solutions that you have in Rn plus one, and you need to patch them together while maintaining the causal relations to get something which is a weak solution in this rather complicated uh, looking space. And we use the temporal function to avoid having to take traces in the Sobolev space, because if we did that, we actually uh, end up in some bad function spaces. So <clears throat> what we do is we can then prove global existence and uniqueness in this globally hyperbolic space. <clears throat> and what we want to do is we want to go from the kind of energy estimates we have on R n plus one into space time energy estimates. And so this is the uh, theorem you get. 
we take our initial data in, in this space, we take our source in L2 lock, and then we get a solution in this rather complicated uh, function space for the initial, initial value problem, which satisfies the support condition. Um, and then, as I said, we want to really change the sort of uh, energy estimates we've got, so we convert things into space-time energy estimates, and then this is really the result that we want. We've got this solution map, which takes us from, uh, this is the initial data in H2, this is the initial data for the derivative, uh, this is the source, and this is uh, the solution here. So this map is a uh, continuous map. So what we now want to do is we want to now see if we can replicate uh, the exact sequence result. And this is where we have to use appropriate function spaces. <coughs> so we start with the space V naught, which are the ones in H2 comp compact, such that the wave operator, or this should actually should be the Klein-Gordon operator, is in H1 comp. U naught is just this space, and then we have the spatially compact version of this. And this, this space here is really, we're looking at the graph norm with respect to, again, this should really be the Klein-Gordon operator here. Yeah. So, armed with this, we can actually define the green operators, as uh, Chris was talking about earlier. You can see they, they here they, they two-sided on these spaces, this, this one on H1 comp and this on V naught, and we have the support condition here. And, and these uh, function spaces, H2 lock and H1 comp, those are Sobolev spaces which don't require the use of some background um, metric to define them. So originally, there were, if you do it in a kind of more obvious way, you end up with different Sobolev spaces, but they, those require a background metric, but in the end, these are the ones that work perfectly. So the key point about all this is this exact sequence result goes through with these spaces here. And now we're in a position to start constructing the symplectic form. So again, it's just a simple calculation that you have this U symmetry result here. And We want to show, talk something about uh, causally compatible subsets. So we want a subset of M to be causally compatible. We say it's causally compatible if when you look at the past and future of within omega, it's the past and future within M just intersected with omega. So all you're saying is that the causal curves stay within omega. They're not, you're not having this sort of thing happening. Uh, uh, and what you need to show is that if you, your green operators are compatible when restricted to causally compatible curves, uh, spaces. 
So we have our green operators, we have our skew symmetric form, we have everything restricts and extends appropriately when you have causally compatible sets. And we're now in a position to define a symplectic structure. So we look at this operator here, this now is G, is the causal propagator. It's bilinear and skew symmetric from the previous result. But as I said, it's degenerate because uh, it has non-zero kernel. But using the exact sequence result, we know that this kernel is just the wave operator or the Klein-Gordon operator applied to V0. So on this quotient space, uh, you have a non-degenerate symplectic form. And once you have this non-degenerate symplectic form, you're just in the business of turning the handle of uh, how one does uh, algebraic quantization. So, as I said earlier, this part of the construction of algebraic quantum field theory turns out to be remarkably independent of any regularity issues. And if you're using the C star algebra approach, you kind of use the exponentiated version of the commutation relations, which are given by uh, this vial system here. So this is sort of the exponentiated view of the standard commutation relations. Um, and the symplectic construction that we used is actually, in the smooth case, also the, the same as a symplectic structure, or more technically, probably a Poisson structure that you get on the phase space, gamma, where you define this, this bilinear form so, that, so on the initial data. So if you think of Q and P as the initial data and the derivatives, you define this. I've formally written it like this. This is the induced volume form. And in fact, you can, these things, even in the low regularity uh, setting, turn out to be uh, isomorphic. So you can either look at the symplectic structure that you generate using the uh, causal propagator factored by the kernel, or else you can use the symplectic structure that comes from the initial data. So the quantum states from the algebraic point of view are simply given as linear functionals on the D star algebra. <coughs> um, and the first thing that you look at are so-called quasi-free states. So the quasi-free states are the things in the algebraic description that cor correspond really to Gaussian states from the conventional way of doing uh, quantum field theory. In the low regularity setting, the existence of quasi-free states is not completely obvious. Um, in the regularity we're working with, you can do this because what you can actually do is you can do an explicit construction for stationary space times to show the existence. It, it, you, you construct an inner product, which is based on the energy momentum tensor, you use that in a product really to talk about um, the positive. You, you use that in a product to construct a set what are essentially the positive frequency solutions. And that's how you're, you're able to talk about quasi free states. 
And having established the existence of quasi-free states in the stationary case, there's a trick that you can do by uh, gluing on your stationary space-time to the actual space-time that you're interested in to construct quasi-free states on a general, general, general um, globally hyperbolic space-time. So provided you have a well-defined energy momentum tensor, you can show using this construction the existence of quasi-free states, that's the equivalent of Gaussian states in low regularity. And that's why if you go be beyond a regularity less than C11, so you can actually do most of the construction as far as this point, not with E11 metrics, but simply Lipschitz metrics. So that was my original intention to do the construction with Lipschitz metrics. And basically everything I've said goes through, except you have to subtract one from all the Sobolev spaces, but it still goes through. The first place I can see where there, where there are issues to do with low regularity is the definition of quasi-free states although it may be possible to avoid that. Uh, uh, so I think quasi-free states, you can probably get through this and still, still define those in this low regularity. But nevertheless, if you just define them in the standard way, this is the first point where you need to think about regularity. More importantly is the... Uh, what you're going to talk about in terms of the physical states. So as I said, when you do this algebraic quant quantization point of view, you get a very nice mathematical description, but the question is, how does it relate to the physics? And you really get more states than you want from the physical perspective, and you have to decide what are the physical, physically reasonable states. Now, the way that that's usually done is by is looking at the Hadamard uh, states, and it's been known for a long time that there's a very nice characterization of the Hadamard states in terms of a microlocal spectrum condition on the two-point function. Um, <coughs> And the other thing that one wants to make contact with conventional quantum field theory is you, you really want to have a notion of states, in particular one particle state. And in, in order to de define that, you need, in, in addition, an object like this object here, mu. So again, in the stationary case, in the low regularity, you can explicitly construct what this mu is. But in general, let's suppose we've got a mu which satisfies this condition here. Um, and then you can, you can show that there's a quasi-free state which has this property, and you can define the two-point function, and it looks uh, in terms, it's, it's got this bit mu here, which comes from this real scalar product, and then you've got the imaginary bit, which comes from your sigma, which is the um, complectic bit that you had. So, what this enables you to do is you can get a pretty explicit form for the uh, Whiteman two-point function. And we need this because we want to actually do a regularization of this in order to show the existence of an appropriate adiabatic state. So when you go to low regularity, you can't expect the Hadamard states to be well-defined anymore because they're going to be using standard wavefront sets. And we're now in the position where we've got Sobolev wavefront sets. So we have to look for something weaker than the Hadamard condition. That's the so-called 
adiabatic ones, and we want to know something pretty explicit about it. And the explicit calculations we want to look at, so let me just, so this is the Hadamard condition, but in the smooth case, you've got this micro-local uh, spectrum condition, so you can restrict your two point functions to give you a bi distribution on m cross m, and then you have these uh, sets here. So these sets here, so this is a point x, this is a point in the tangent, cotangent space, this is a point y in m, this is a point in the cotangent space, and um, these points here, are, this is just saying they're null, and x is equivalent to y, is telling you really that you, you've got a causal curve here connecting x to y, and you're taking a, well, I'll draw it as a tangent, it's really a cotangent, and you're parallel propagating it along here, and it's ending up at the other one, and together with a switch of directions, that's uh, just slightly complicated there, but that's your equivalence relation, and so, <coughs> so that's what I'm saying here, x psi is equivalent to y eta means that these cotangents are cotangents of null geodesic at x and y, which is connecting them, and you parallelly tra transport one along to the other. And then you can, using these sets, you can define uh, the micro-local wavefront condition, so you can, in terms of this wavefront set, which says the wavefront set of this two-point function should just be this thing C plus, which uh, I defined here. So that's the points in C, where these are just future pointing. You notice you, you switch the time on and off. That's what this prime here means. It's just instead of having eta, you've got nine times. So I don't want to go into the details of that, but that's what one does um, in the smooth case. And the, those just reproduce the standard physical states in the particular case of Minkowski space. In low regularity, what you have to do is you work instead with a Sobolev wavefront set on HS, where now your definition of wavefront set is not looking at regularity in terms of smoothness, you're looking at regularity in terms of the Sobolev space here. Um, so as I said, what we wanted to do was do an ex pretty explicit calculation in principle for a globally hyperbolic low regularity space time. But in fact, all we were able to do so far was the ultrastatic space. space. So this, this is the form of the space time we're looking at. Are we going to assume that this Riemannian bit is just simply C11? <clears throat> and what you get in this case is that you get a, a wavefront set, this a Sobolev wavefront set with this regularity uh, for every epsilon and C plus. So that's telling you something about the uh, adiabatic states that you get once you go to low regularity, and the source of adiabatic state you get actually depends on the degree of regularity you have in the metric. So I won't go through the method of proof, but you actually have to look at micro-local estimates for 
it says for the causal propagator, what you actually have to do is you have to look at regularizations of the causal prop propagator, then look at those estimates, and then look what, what you can do by looking at subsequences. Uh, you have to use, as is expected, the propagation of singularities results, but the, now for non-smooth pseudo-differential operators. And because we're looking at the ultrastatics case, we have available results from elliptic theory, and that's really why we worked with the ultrastatic space. So we've got some eigenvalue asymptotics for that. And you can put all that together, and the, this is the end result. If you start with an ultrastatic C11 metric, then this particular regularity of wave front sets, Sobolev wave front sets with exponent to half, or a half minus epsilon, uh, any epsilon greater than zero is uh, what you get. So that's, uh, that's really all I want to say. Uh, I'll just make a few very quick concluding results. So it's really, this whole calculation was just a proof of concept of what one could do if one was to do conventional algebraic quantum field theory in low regularity. I haven't done the calculations, but I'm pretty convinced, in fact, you can go through the entire construction, not just in the ultrastatic case, but in the general case, uh, for C11 globally hyperbolic space times. Once you go be below that regularity, then the first problem one encounters is the definition of quasi-free states, which I think one can deal with. The causal propagator, actually, you can go right down to Lipschitz without any, any real issues at all. But when you look at the adiabatic states, I really find it hard to see how you can have any generalization of the Hadamard condition that works much be below the regularity we're using at the moment. So I think there's a real issue as to what you mean by the physical states of quantum system if you have a metric which is lower than C11 regularity. So that's, that's kind of the take home message from this talk. How do you think about physics on space times, so we're not just saying we want to define the Einstein equations, but we want to do physics on it, and particularly we want to do quantum field theory on it, then what are the limits to regularity with that? I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs>